Um, Hinrich is um, with the University of Munich. Uh, he's a professor of computational linguistics and uh, the director of the Center for Information and Language Processing in Munich. Uh, before that, he was at the University of Stuttgart. And I think all of us are very well familiar with his excellent uh, work um, on representation learning in NLP and on um, a set of other uh, topics. He's a co-author of important textbooks uh, for our field, such as Foundations of Statistical NLP and Introduction to Information Retrieval. Also, he was awarded a European Research uh, Council Advanced um, Award in 2017. And he's an action editor of Tackle. And until last year, he was the president of the Association for Computational um, Linguistics. So um, with this, I'd like to hand over to Hinrich and invite him to share the slides. Can you see the slides? Yes, that works. Thank you very much. And we are very much looking forward to your talk, Humans Learn from Task Descriptions, and so should our models. Okay, well, thank you very much, Irina, and uh, thank you very much for um, to all um, organizers for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here at the first LSNLP workshop. So I want to start with a question, uh, how do humans learn? And with a uh, pomegranate. Let's look at a typical example of human learning, how to open and eat a pomegranate. The best way to, so I want to show a YouTube video, or just 30 seconds of it, uh, the best way to open and eat uh, a pomegranate. Um, and so I would like to ask you to um, pay attention to two things. The descriptions that the instructor gives uh, in that uh, 30 seconds and uh, the number of training instances that are given uh, in those 30 seconds. And please read the closed captions because uh, I'm not sure whether the sound is going to work for everybody over Zoom. So please read the closed captions. Okay, one second. Okay, can you see the YouTube screen? Yes. Yes, okay, great. Let's hope that there's no ad. Easy way to get at it. Because let's face it, these things can be kind of a pain in the butt to open and they can be messy. But here's a way that is much easier. Now what you're gonna need is obviously a pomegranate along with a knife and a bowl of cool water. Now, pomegranates are a sectional fruit. If you look closely at a pomegranate, you will see on the outside that there are six ridges. And uh, what you wanna do is take your knife and just score the pomegranate along the ridge. What that means is, is you don't want to cut through to the seeds real quickly. You just want to cut through the skin. Just cut. Now what you want to do is break your pomegranate open above your bowl of water. So the pomegranate should be. Okay, hopefully you were able to see the video and uh, read the captions. So what did we see here? Uh, the teacher gives a detailed description of the task and of the solution. The task description uh, is, um, we want a way of opening and eating a pomegranate that is not a pain in the butt and is not messy. Uh, and the solution description or part of it is score the pomegranate along the ridges. There are very few training instances here, just three if you count it, uh, at least three of uh, the core part of the instruction score the pomegranate along the ridge. So this is arguably a typical form of human learning. We have a detailed description and we have very few training instances, 10 or fewer. So I'm not claiming that uh, all of human learning is like that, uh, that it can be very different, there are very different uh, forms of human learning, but it seems like that is one 
very important uh, type of human learning to have descriptions available and to um, be in a situation where only very few training instances are available. Uh, and uh, there's something else about the video that's interesting. Uh, so it contains a lot of stuff that's extraneous to this talk, of course, but I think it gives you uh, a nice example for how rich uh, human teaching and learning environments are and compare that to how impoverished often our machine learning environments are. So um, uh, what I would like to suggest is that uh, it's worthwhile to look at our rich uh, human learning environments and think about elements we can transfer from them to uh, the machine learning environments. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the higher level point of this talk. Uh, and we are going to do that specifically in this talk for descriptions. So typical machine learning setup is no descriptions, large training sets. Uh, even if you do a few short learning, often that is applied to cases where you have thousands of examples, which is not really few shot. Uh, so that leads to the motivation for our approach. Humans take advantage of task descriptions our machine learning models don't, generally. This is specifically a problem in few-shot learning because if you think about few-shot learning, you have a very small training set, let's say 10. It's not really possible in most cases to learn a well-performing model from just 10 training instances. So you need some other source of information and descriptions seem like a great uh, form of other information that you can use. So how can uh, task descriptions benefit machine learning? Uh, we first want to look at uh, one success story in this regard in NLP, which is GPT-3, because GPT-3 makes uh, effective use of task descriptions. So that was the first part of the talk, how do humans learn? Uh, then next we go to GPT-3 and how it uses task descriptions. Then uh, I will talk about our own model PET, Pattern Exploiting Training, which makes use of task descriptions, we believe in a better way than GPT-3. And finally, some experimental results that show that PET outperforms uh, GPT-3. I'm sorry, Henrik, could you make your slides full screen? Somebody in the audience uh, has asked. Um, how do I do that? So I'm using uh, Foxit and- I think if you just resize your window, then we will not see so much gray stuff on the size of the slides. Is that possible? Um, let me look in view whether... Or, or just F11 in, in Fox, it should work. F11 to Fox. F11? Maybe. <laughs> Works for me. No, if I press F11 here, that doesn't happen and on view there is no because um hmm uh does anybody else have a suggestion so in view mm -hmm. there there doesn't seem to be a um full screen options option i could resize the screen but that might take a while because i'm this is my presentation uh laptop and i actually don't know how to do that very well in Linux. Yeah, then let's stay with this. Yeah, I apologize for that. My students have never complained about that. So um, uh, yeah, I will try to fix that later. Uh, so let me introduce the team to you. It consists of Timo Schick. Uh, he conceived of the idea and did the actual work. And myself, I'm his PhD advisor. Uh, Timo will present a poster at this uh, workshop. So please uh, I invite you to um, virtually walk over to his poster and talk with him. Okay, so on to part two, GPT-3 and task descriptions. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with GPT-3, but let's just quickly um, review it. It's a transformer-based language model, very large model, pre-trained on very large corpora. The key innovation in my opinion is that no supervised fine tuning is done for a specific task. Instead, uh, what it does is in-context learning, and I will call that priming in this talk. So an example from priming for priming is here. It's actually different 
for each task slightly, but uh, one example would be that we have a task description, a few training instances, and a close question. And that's concatenated and given as the input to GPT-3. So here is this example. So we have the task description, translate English to French. We have three training instances, thanks, merci, hello, bonjour, mint, monde. And then we have the close question and GPT-3 then fills in here uh, the translation, the French translation of cheese. There are no parameter updates happening during priming. Uh, so the model changes its state, of course, as, is, as it uh, reads the priming input, but it, in a sense, it doesn't learn anything. It adapts through its state and therefore it can solve the task, but you could argue that no real learning takes place for a specific task. And specifically, of course, no supervised learning takes part. Now, GPT-3 has excellent few shot performance. So if you just look at the SuperGrew average here and compare the performance uh, between GPT-3 and BERT large, then um, it beats BERT large, which is quite impressive given that it doesn't do any supervised training, which BERT large, of course, does do. Uh, let's uh, focus on the task descriptions in GPT-3. Uh, and I would like you to look at this, uh, these two curves here, the two blue curves. This here is GPT-3 proper. And uh, what you see is a comparison between using the task descriptions, that's called here natural language prompt, versus not using them. And you can see that the gap, uh, that the increase in performance that the task description gives you is quite large, um, at least for one example. Uh, so if you have a few shots, that's my takeaway from, from this uh, experiment. If you just have a very small number of shots, then the task description can make a huge difference. Of course, at some point, for example, for 10 uh, training instances, there's no difference anymore. And that's to be expected as you increase uh, the training set size, at some point, the task description is not going to help you anymore. Uh, so, um, arguably, uh, humans do do parameter updates when they learn. For example, um, you don't start from scratch when you open a second pomegranate uh, a day later. So, um, if you, you've watched the video, you've learned something from the video, hopefully, uh, the YouTube video I showed. And so, tomorrow, if I give you a pomegranate, you can make uh, use of what you've learned to do a better job uh, at opening it. And um, uh, that's not the case for GPT-3. Um, it um, arguably, as I've uh, said, doesn't learn anything after the completion of pre-training. So if uh, GPT-3 uh, watches the YouTube video today, metaphorically, uh, and then I give it a um, pomegranate tomorrow, it starts from scratch. It knows nothing. It has, hasn't retained anything from the YouTube video. So that, that doesn't seem ideal. Um, and so um, our basic idea is why not use both, both the task description and uh, supervised learning, combine the powers of task description and supervised learning, which is what humans do. And um, that uh, leads us to pet our system pattern exploiting training. So in a, in a sense, the uh, GPT-3 uh, designers uh, tied their hands by saying they didn't want to use supervised learning. They had good reasons for that, and we can discuss that. But uh, if you just want to get a good performance on an application that you care about, then I think uh, you should use supervised learning. A terminological note, uh, task description can be description of the task proper, of an aspect of the task, of the solution, of properties of training instances. Uh, I will use task description for all of these. Uh, so. It, just think of it for the moment as a very uh, fuzzy notion that refers to descriptions that are useful to the language model in uh, solving the task. Okay, so the meat of the talk is um, our new model, Pattern Exploiting Training, PET. Uh, so first, uh, please keep in mind the abbreviations. Uh, I will use it um, throughout the talk, PET. Uh, so first we need a task and a training set. The task is uh, sentiment analysis. That's going to be my running example. 
So we have uh, a restaurant review here, excellent pizza. And we have a gold label, one positive. And that gives us a training instance, excellent pizza one. We vary the size of the training set size from zero to 1000, but we are particularly interested in 10 because 10 is true few shot learning. Now, um, the first major ingredient of a pet is the pattern. And you can think of the pattern as roughly being a closed question. That's not quite accurate. And we will see later how it differs from a simple closed question. Um, so an example pattern might is that we use is review, it was mask, where for the review here in italics, we um, fill in uh, the review. Uh, so a filled in pattern would look like this. Excellent pizza, it was mask. Here's another pattern review. In summary, the restaurant is mask and filled in. It looks like this excellent pizza. In summary, the restaurant is mask. So this here is uh, the input to the language model and the language model will then predict uh, substitutions for mask and that's how we solve the task. And the um, second part we need is on the next slide. That's the verbalizer. The verbalizer associates mask substitutions with class labels. So in our example, uh, uh, the word good uh, is associated with the label one and the word bad is associated with the label zero. So that uh, means that good and bad are label descriptions here, used as label descriptions. Um, uh, and the, the, the basic idea here is that um, this taps into the masked language model's pre-trained knowledge of the, of the task in the sense that the language model already knows what the meaning of good and the meaning of bad is. And uh, because it has some understanding of uh, natural language that has, it has acquired in pre-training. So by um, equating um, a word that it knows the meaning of with a label, we give the language model some important information about the task. Um, so the task description in this case is mainly in the form of label descriptions. Uh, the, the label description is kind of the core of that. And so here you see a simple example for what's happening. The language model probably knows that excellent pizza, it was good, is a lot more probable than excellent pizza, it was bad. This discourse here is uh, coherent. Uh, so it will get a high probability. This discourse here is not coherent. So it will get a low probability. The language model knows that without having seen a single training instance. So this is even going to work zero shot. And uh, we, I will actually show that the zero shot performance of our method is clearly above baseline. Uh, so we're giving the language model uh, inf important information about the task uh, through, um, through the uh, task description and um, um, it taps into what the language model already knows. Let's look at the entire architecture um, in or, or workflow uh, in um, uh, involving both the verbalizer and the pattern. So we start with a training instance, excellent pizza one. Uh, then we use a pattern and um, fill the uh, review into the review slot, excellent pizza, it was mask. This is the input to the language model. The language model then predicts for the mask um, the label words, good and bad. Uh, the verbalizer then associates that back to the original class labels. And that gives us then a probability distribution over the classes. Uh, and finally, um, the supervised uh, training part is that we fine tune the MLM with cross entropy by uh, comparing with um, the uh, training instances um, uh, the, uh, that we have from the training set. So that's the basic idea of PET. Uh, there are some additional things that we need to make it work well, which come next. Let me just briefly introduce the formalization we use. So we have a pattern PX, that's a function from input to close question. For example, a function from a review to a close question. We have a verbalizer VL, that's an injective function from class labels to English words. 
uh, usually we use the two together. So very often when I say pattern, I really mean pattern verbalizer pair. Uh, then we can use the language model to give us a uh, distribution of label given filled in pattern. Uh, and that's, uh, we only compute that over the label words. So we ignore all words uh, in the language model vocabulary that are not label words. So for example, just good and bad. And then finally, we train by uh, cross entropy comparing uh, this uh, distribution with the truth, the discrete distribution we have from the training set. Okay, so we need a couple of elements to make this work well. And one is we want to exploit multiple patterns. And that's very simple. Let me just run through this example here. So we have a review, let's say, um, we want to classify it. What I've just described to you for one pattern, of course, we can do for three patterns, as long as you can think up three patterns. So we have three patterns here um, uh, with associated verbalizers. And uh, recall that we train uh, a separate language model for each pattern. So we have three language models. Uh, we apply the language models to the filled in patterns, and then we get scores for the labels. Um, and um, we can aggregate those to an aggregate score. And then that gives us the final classification decision. So it's very easy to um, use several patterns. Uh, here's an example for several patterns. Um, uh, here are the, uh, it's again our sentiment task. Here are the label descriptions. For example, great for five stars and terrible for one star. And here are the patterns we use with that. Uh, it was mask review, just mask review. All in all, it was mask review summary, the restaurant is mask. And you can see that there's quite an interesting variety here, especially if you compare the first two and the second two. So um, that's a very important part of using our approach here. The, you, you have to have somebody, uh, a system designer who can who understands enough about the language model and enough about the task to come up with good patterns that's kind of the art uh, that uh, we need here uh, somebody to be capable of and um, uh, um, uh, because yeah it's uh, it's uh, it's really a, a creative uh, um, uh, uh, task uh, to be able to do that um, um, and uh, there's no limit to the imagination. So uh, if you are good at this, then you can create a lot of great patterns. Why are multiple patterns uh, so critical? The patterns provide human expertise, the more the better. So um, you actually inject knowledge about the task into the process by, uh, by using the patterns. And I think that's a good thing. Um, and the more patterns you have, the more knowledge you can inject. And I think it's a good thing because uh, you could argue that realistic few shot learning is difficult without human expertise. If you have just 10 uh, training instances, it's difficult to learn a task well from just 10 training instances. So you need some other source of information and uh, human expertise seems like a good source of information. And so the patterns allow you to, um, to inject that into the process. Now, can we try out multiple patterns and just keep the best one? Because it's simpler if you just have a single pattern. Um, no, not really, because in true few shot learning, there's no development set available. If you had a large enough development set to be able to reliably select the best pattern out of a bunch that you tried, then it wouldn't be few shot anymore. Uh, so in our view, um, uh, you, you don't have a development set in a few short learning. Okay, a couple of other things that are needed to make this work. One is distillation. So uh, there, there's a pattern specific individual model for, for each pattern. So if you have 10 patterns, you have 10 models, but ideally you want to be able to work with a single model. So how do you do that? Very simple. You use the individual models to label and unlabeled data set T. So we do need an extra resource here, which is an unlabeled data set T. Uh, then uh, we can aggregate the scores uh, to label T. 
aggregate them across the model. So uh, in this way, the unlabeled data set is automatically labeled. And then we train a final um, PET model on T. So that gives us a single model. And then the last uh, element we need to make it work well is iPad iterative training. And so what we found is that if you use the unlabeled data in one fell swoop, then um, the learning problem is not very stable. Uh, so um, to get a more robust version of uh, this um, use of unlabeled data, what we do is we gradually increase the use of labeled data over several uh, generations. And we do that by first training, a first generation of models on the um, labeled training set. And then we look at the unlabeled data and only take that part of un the unlabeled data for which this first generation of models is most confident. That's a pretty common trick, I guess. And uh, so we get small training sets that include some of the unlabeled data. Then we can um, uh, create a second generation of models then we can create a second generation of training sets that take more uh, of the unlabeled data. And then finally, we have the final set of models. And um, uh, then comes the distillation. We automatically label all the unlabeled data and um, train the final classifier. And uh, so I'm going to use the abbreviation IPAD for this iterative version of um, uh, PET, so please remember the acronym IPAD. So to summarize, um, the key points for PET are the pattern verbalizer uh, taps into L the language model's pre-trained knowledge of the task. Um, patterns are a way of incorporating human expertise into the learning problem. Uh, PET exploits multiple patterns. It's important to use all human expertise available. It's truly few shot. Uh, we don't need a development set to select a single uh, best pattern. In contrast to GPT-3, PET is supervised. We make full use of the power of supervision here. And as we'll see uh, in the next section, it has excellent few shot performance. Before we get to that, let's ask the question, what exactly is a task description? So this here is a st straightforward task description translate English to French, uh, describes the task of translating English to French. But actually, even in this case, it is not a straightforward task description because um, it's not just that one line, but this, of course, is also very important, this arrow and this formatting of the instances. Uh, because you could think of many other ways you could format the instances. Um, and um, uh, so it's not uh, task description really is a misnomer. It's more about translating the task into a plain text structure. Um, it has to be plain text because that's what the language models are trained on. And um, uh, it has to be a plain text structure that the language model understands well and that corresponds closely to the task. But how exactly you do that there's, uh, there's many, many possibilities of doing it. And just to make sure that um, this point doesn't get lost because I think it's quite important in this uh, talk, uh, let's look again at our um, running example. So we have the label description uh, for sentiment uh, here. This is the label description. And we have our patterns here. Now, um, the, of course, the verbalizer and the patterns, the label descriptions and the patterns have to be coordinated. Uh, so, the, for example, grade here is a, is a good substitution for mask if it's a great review. Um, but, of course, the pattern has to be constructed so that it is a good, uh, um, that the verbalizer labels are a good uh, substitution uh, for the mask. So, so verbalizer and pattern here have to be coordinated. And it's really uh, the um, composite of verbalizer and pattern that makes up the task description. Here, just to show you the variety of um, ways you can do it, uh, here we have two other tasks. Um, so this one 
uh, in this case, the pattern is simply a question. Does W have the same meaning in both sentences? This is the word in context task. You get two sentences. Uh, the same word occurs in both sentences. And the question is, does W have the same meaning in both sentences? Um, the labels here are same sense and different sense, and they are just mapped to yes and no. Uh, so in this case, the, lab the verbalizer contributes relatively little uh, to in terms of a description, and the main uh, onus lies on the pattern. And finally, um, the final example, Winograd schema challenge, uh, where you have to do a pronoun resolution. Um, in this case, our pattern is in the previous sentence, the pronoun P refers to mask. And here, the language model has to substitute uh, one of the nouns in the paragraph that was the input. And uh, here, we simply use uh, identity. So we restrict the prediction to, um, to the nouns that occur in the paragraph, similar to what GPT-3 does. So this is, again, a different way of using verbalizers and patterns. So what exactly is a task description? Task descriptions are not simple descriptions of the task. Uh, they can be complex translations of the structure of the task, task into plain text, plus a mask. We always need a mask. Uh, task descriptions are created by the system designer based on their understanding of task and language model. And that's difficult to automate and requires the ingenuity of the system designer. So I think. Uh, GPT-3 has its way of doing it. Uh, Timo came up with this pattern uh, labelizer, uh, verbalizer way of doing it. But I'm sure there are many other ways. And uh, I'm also sure that many of them are actually better than what we did. So the last part is the experimental part. Pet outperforms GPT-3. And actually, let me start with some experiments just on Pet to show you how Pet performs. At the in the bottom right corner here, I will always give you the language model we're using. Because remember that PET fine tunes a language model, an underlying language model. So it's always built on top of a language model. And here, that language model is Roberta Large. This experiment is on Yelp full, 10 uh, training examples. And so the first thing to notice is that, uh, so Yelp has um, uh, five labels, star, 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 and so on. I showed them to you earlier. And so the baseline performance is 20%. So if you look at supervised performance, uh, it's barely above baseline. It is basically baseline. So if you take Roberta Large and you fine tune it on 10 training instances, that's not enough for it to learn the task. It basically fails. In contrast, this here is PET, unsupervised, so without any training uh, instances. And our performance here is 33.8. I didn't explain unsupervised PET to you, but it basically just uses the task description and uh, no training instances. So that shows you the potential of the task description. It gets you that far above the baseline. This comparison here is between the worst pattern in this experiment and the best pattern. And you see that there's quite a big uh, gap here, uh, more than 10%. Uh, so that brings home the point that it's very important to uh, pay attention to the patterns. And you can't get away with just uh, saying, OK, I'm going to design a pattern and just run with it, because it might be a pretty bad pattern. And that's why it's important to support multiple patterns. That's, that's really key to make this work. Uh, and finally, the uh, performance of PET and iPad, 52.9 and 57.6. Uh, and I think that's very nice performance for just 10 training examples. So um, again, that shows you the power of the um, uh, task description. Uh, this looks at the effect of training set size again for Yelp full. Um, uh, we're comparing here the supervised baseline with PET and iPET. Uh, this you saw on the previous slide uh, for 10 examples. We get a huge advantage compared to the supervised uh, baseline. And that's still true for 50, you have 60 versus 45. And for 100 training examples, 62 versus uh, 53. Um, uh, at some point, it becomes less and less. And so here, we just have 65 and 63. Again, that's to be expected as you increase uh, the training set size. But uh, the take home message here is 
um, uh, the task description gives you a huge advantage for few shot learning where few shot ranges here in this case at least to 100. This is a comparison with other semi-supervised methods, uh, UDA and mixed text, again on uh, training, uh, 10 training examples. And you can see that um, um, PET is clearly better than uh, these other um, uh, semi-supervised methods. So it seems like, at least for this type of task, a, a task description is the way to go if you want to do semi-supervised learning. Okay, let's uh, turn to GPT-3. In this case, we use Albert XX Large as our underlying uh, language model. And so the sizes of uh, the three models are uh, 175 billion for GPT-3, uh, 350 million for GPT-3 MED, which we are also going to look at, and 223 million for PET, which is really the size of Albert XX Large. And so um, the size of PET is 0.1% of GPT-3. So we have, we're comparing here a tiny model iPad with a huge model uh, GPT-3. So this is really a, a comparison bet between uh, Goliath and David. Uh, GPT-3 is Goliath and PET is David. Okay, let's compare them on Superglue with uh, 32 training examples. Uh, we're comparing here uh, GPT-3 MED, GPT-3 PET and IPET. And um, you can see that in some cases PET is, is better. For example, here on the CB task, PET is better. And sometimes uh, GPT-3 is better. For example, here on the record task, GPT-3 is better. But if you look at the average, then uh, IPET in particular has the edge with 77 uh, for IPET versus uh, 73. Uh, for GPT-3. So I think that's a pretty uh, good result that um, uh, that uh, our tiny model can beat uh, GPT-3. And the reason of course is the power of supervised uh, training. If you make good use of these 32 training examples through supervision, then uh, you can get much better performance than uh, if you don't use supervision. And uh, also relevant here is the comparison with uh, GPT-3 MED because you could argue, well, maybe uh, if you decrease the size of the model, it would still perform pretty well, but that's not the case because if you reduce GPT-3 to the size of iPad so that it also becomes a tiny model, then it no longer works. Uh, so you get a very low performance on uh, Superglue. I'm gonna skip this slide. Uh, this kind of side issue, but a very important one. The question here is how does how do the results depend on your particular choice of 32 training examples? So we compare three sets of 32 training examples here and uh, uh, look at the results. I'm just going to look at the average here and you can see that there are actually uh, can be big differences in which 32 training examples you select. Um, uh, up to 5% um, here in this example. So the choice of shots matters a lot. Uh, the, the choice of the uh, training examples you use and truly few shot learning. And for this reason, uh, Timo uh, has published uh, the seeds that he's using here. Uh, and he's calling that data set few glue. So if you want to compare with our results, then you can easily do that by downloading that data. Okay, let's uh, do a final comparison of PET and GPT-3. Uh, so as far as uh, few shot performance is concerned, uh, PET has great performance, GPT-3 has great performance. So that's a plus for both. Uh, as far as model size is concerned, uh, PET is very small, GPT-3 is huge. That makes PET uh, broadly deployable. So that's, uh, but GPT-3 is not. So that's a big plus for PET. Uh, the training set, uh, the few shot training set. Uh, so uh, the, the GPT-3 has a context window limit. Uh, so there's only so many few shots you can uh, fit into um, the context window. Um, in contrast, PET can exploit all training data. There's no such limit. So that gives an advantage to PET. I argued that um, few shot learning means that you 
don't really have a development set. Uh, so if you uh, rely on a single pattern, then uh, you implicitly assume that you have a development set because how did you select that pattern? And if you read the GPT-3 paper, they kind of, kind of you, you get away with the impression that they actually did uh, do some selection of patterns um, based on a development set. Uh, so that's a big advantage of a PET that it doesn't need a development set because it supports multiple patterns. Uh, supervision, PET is supervised, GPT-3 is unsupervised. I've argued that supervision improves performance. So that's a big pet, a big um, advantage for pet. On the other hand, different pet models, uh, you have different pet models for each task uh, because uh, um, yeah, that's how a supervised training works. You train the model, the parameters change, you end up with a different model. Um, so, and that's, uh, so if you have a hundred tasks, you need a hundred models, which is uh, cumbersome uh, and also can easily run into memory issues. Uh, so the nice thing about GPT-3 is it is a single model. It's not updated. Uh, it's not trained in a supervised way. So it's a single model and that's a big advantage for GPT-3. And that's kind of a disadvantage of using supervised training. Uh, task fluidity, GPT-3 mimics human fluidity. So um, humans generally don't put tasks in silos and say, well, this is one task, this is a completely separate task. They can fluidly move from task to task. They can mix tasks. And uh, the nice thing about uh, GPT-3 is that it has the same property since it doesn't um, have a, uh, a particular task taxon taxonomy that uh, was given to it. And finally, I didn't talk about that, but uh, generation is uh, hard in PET and easy in GPT-3. Uh, GPT-3 easily handles generative tasks. So that's another uh, plus for GPT-3. So to summarize, uh, PET leverages uh, task descriptions uh, for better few short learning. Uh, task descriptions uh, are a way of incorporating human expertise into the learning problem. PET exploits multiple patterns. That's important to make use of all uh, human expertise available. It's truly few shot. Uh, so you don't need any tuning on a development set. And uh, the main point was uh, PET is supervised. It makes full power of the of supervision, full use of the power of supervision, which is a good thing. And it has uh, excellent few shot performance. Uh, let me say a final word about the full potential of descriptions. Uh, we have seen diverse uh, types of task descriptions here, uh, both in GPT-3 and in PET. Uh, task descriptions in PET are pattern verbalizer combinations, where the verbalizer mostly provides label descriptions. What is key in both cases is that the, the method exploits the language model's understanding of language descriptions. Uh, for uh, the task. Uh, so you associate language descriptions with some aspect of the task. And since the language model understands language descriptions, it has learned some natural language understanding in uh, pre-training. It also learns something about the task through that association. Um, uh, and um, this gives the method then a head start compared to other few shot learners who don't have access to a task description or don't understand it because they don't have the language understanding of a language model. There are many other types of descriptions you could use, solution descriptions, uh, comments or training instances, useful background information. And, and as I explained earlier, it's really about translating the task into a plain text structure that captures the task well for the language model. Uh, and I think that's that's a very interesting and complex problem that uh, I, I think a lot of interesting work can be done on. Going to skip that. Uh, I would like to thank the European Research Council for funding this research. And I want to leave you with uh, this final slide. So here you have a pomegranate as a, a symbol for the power of task descriptions. And here you have a graph that shows you supergroup performance as a function of size. Uh, so you have 
the Goliath here, GPT-3, this huge model, which gets very good performance on Superglue. And then you have David here, a pet and iPad. So these are single points uh, because we don't vary the size. Um, so you have uh, David here, um, a pet and iPad, and uh, they, have, uh, they are tiny. This is logarithmic, of course. They are tiny, but the, yet they get slightly better performance than GPT-3. And that's uh, the end of the talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Hinrik. I really enjoyed uh, listening to your talk and we already have uh, quite many questions. So um, let me start with the first question. Wondering how easy, useful it is to extend this to tasks beyond classification. Very good question. That's something that we're working on. And uh, it's not so easy, uh, but I think it can be done. So um, watch this space for, uh, um, for, uh, for uh, further information on that. I, for, for a number of reasons, I don't really want to talk uh, more about that, but um, uh, uh, um, yeah, I agree with the question. It's, it's e rel relatively easy for classification, but um, it, uh, I think it can be done for other types of tasks as well. And if you look to GPT-3, it actually does uh, use task descriptions for other tasks. So uh, that's also an indicator that it can be done. All right, thanks. So the next question asks about something which you have um, discussed in the talk briefly, but maybe still you want to make a comment on that. So the question is, it seems that the performance of PET is closely tied to lots of patents that work well. Isn't this essentially training data? So is it really appropriate to speak of few shot learning? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So you, a different way of um, uh, putting the problem would be um, what human expertise expertise is available and how do you, um, uh, uh, what human resources are available and how do you use them best. Um, but uh, so one comment on that would be that it's uh, a very rich information about the task. If you give uh, a training instance, then that's just one training instance. If you give a task description, then that the information density of that is much, much higher. Uh, so um, if um, you measure it, let's say, in the amount of time you need to, um, uh, to, you need to put in as a system designer to get your system up and running and for it to have a good performance, then a task description might be a better bet. Um, but I mean, I, I, I stress this human expertise part because I think um, we, uh, some people may think, well, um, you know, we want to do everything automatically and uh, uh, the human should be, uh, should be involved as little as possible. But I think f in reality to solve most uh, real problems, we need a human in the loop somehow. And, and so um, I think this is a very good way of putting the human in the loop. Um, and, uh, but it is true that in that sense, it is not a fair comparison to other methods that don't use this human expertise, like the other semi-supervised methods I uh, compared with. Um, uh, so I, I grant that point, definitely. Strictly speaking, it's not um, training data. Uh, I mean, uh, because uh, if you look at the definition of training data, it's not training data. It's a different type of information that is provided here to the learner. All right, thanks. Andre, would you like to explain your question yourself? Unclear, then I read the question. Uh, very nice work. I'm wondering if there are alternatives to training multiple models and distill them if we want to scale to a large number of patents. Can we still use PET with a single multitask model from the beginning? Um, 
I, I don't really see a problem with that. I mean, you know, you could, uh, you can, uh, I mean, at some point, if you get into millions uh, of patterns, uh, it might become a problem. But uh, of course, you can run this uh, process uh, uh, sequentially, as opposed to in parallel, you can uh, do the automatic labeling that you need uh, for one model and then the next model. So there's not a problem in terms of fitting lots of, you don't have to fit several models at the same time into the same machine. Uh, so um, uh, I don't really see, I, I'm not sure what order of magnitude you're thinking about, but if you're thinking about thousands of patterns, I think that should be doable. All right, thanks. Um, Ivan, are you there to explain the question? Yes, um, so my question was uh, what, uh, you don't want to use label data, but in principle, you can assume access to unlabeled data. Is there a way for you to uh, decide which patterns are good, weight the patterns maybe uh, relying on agreement signal on unlabeled data? So basically the intuition could be that uh, patterns uh, are uh, more likely to agree if uh, the output is correct, right? Uh, so, of course, there may be collusion, but uh, maybe this is uh, something which is possible to learn. And I think in aggregation literacy before, not in this context of GPT, this type of information uh, was uh, studied and found sometimes useful. Uh, I completely agree with that point. Uh, so I, uh, we, I don't think we thought very hard about how to, uh, how, how to pick patterns in some way that's compatible with the framework we've adopted here. And there may well be ways of doing that. However, um, and actually in the paper, there, there's one way of weighting uh, patterns, if I recall, uh, I think that's in the pattern. Uh, so we did experiment a little bit in that direction, but um, uh, the, the problem is ideally you want you, you will never never be sure. And um, the question is why take the risk that um, you end up with bad patterns? Uh, why not use all of them? That seems an easy and uh, given our framework with the distillation, not very expensive uh, um, process to do, the, to do it that way. But, but I, I agree that there's certainly interesting work that can be done there. And if somebody comes up with a really good method for estimating um, the quality of a pattern just based on unlabeled data, then uh, that would be a clear improvement. Thank you, Henrik. The next question is also related to patents. Uh, it is from Jakub. Um, so uh, great work, impressive results, results and a very nice talk. Have you thought of a way to let the language model itself uh, generate a larger set of promising patterns for you? And would a larger set of patterns usually get, give better performance? So there's some work, uh, which unfortunately I, I should know more details about that tries to generate the patterns automatically. Uh, and um, um, the, um, but, but uh, it's a very nice approach, but the problem with those patterns was that uh, they were not really easily humanly interpretable. So they kind of worked, or they did work, but they didn't have this nice property that uh, you could read them and understand them. Um, but uh, that's just one paper in that direction. And um, that's, uh, I think, yeah, I think that's a very interesting direction. Maybe I can say that we did look into, um, uh, in this paper here, we did look into trying to automate uh, the construction of the verbalizer uh, I, I think it goes a little bit in the direction of, can you automate part of this process? So, so for the verbalizer, we looked at that and it looks like you, you take a hit in performance, but you can partially automate um, the verbalizer construction, but maybe you could do the same thing for the pattern. I think that's also a promising direction. Um, on the other hand, I kind of like the idea of 
you know, putting the human in the loop and uh, relying on their expertise to uh, to really uh, get good good performance in reality. So uh, I, I'm I'm personally I personally don't have a problem that the system designer also has to do some work here, and that ideally there should be a good system designer who has good intuitions about what kinds of patterns are needed. Okay, thank you. So the next question is from uh, uh, Jonathan. Um, thanks for the great talk. I totally agree with the no development set uh, comment, but you can argue that you, have, you can have only a development set. Uh, what happens if you choose the best pattern using the 10 examples and do not do any training? Is that better or worse than training for so few examples? Um, so, I mean, I think my arguments work best for... Um, uh, Uh, where's my the slide that I want to find? Um, I think my argument works best for for a very low uh, for a very few shot uh, case, uh, like ten examples. And in that case, um, not using a um, uh, um, not not using um, uh, the training instances at all. Uh, you get uh, performance that is still, I mean, it's amazing that without any training instances, you can get such a good performance, but it's it's pretty low. So I'm not sure I understood the question correctly. Uh, if you, so this I believe is averaged over patterns. Uh, so maybe the question was, if you took your very best pattern selected on the 10 training instances that you, you use as a development set, would you then get um, better performance? And that's a very good question. We didn't do that uh, experiment, so we probably should. I have a strong intuition that uh, using multiple patterns and um, training each of them on 10 training uh, examples is going to be better than taking the single best pattern, even if you knew what the single best pattern is, and not training it at all. Um, but that's just a guess. So uh, that's a very good um, suggestion. We, uh, we should do that experiment. I can, I can verify that that guess, at least for the examples that we, we had in the first paper. OK, thanks, Timo. So this is Timo, the author of this work. And uh, um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So um, last question, since we are running out of time, is from York, also related to the problem of training many models. Would it be possible to freeze most parameters of the language model and just train a few layers for the specific task? Would that still work well enough? So I guess the uh, the thrust of the comment is that, uh, or the, the, the idea is that then you wouldn't have such a bad duplication of models because just a few uh, parameters are updated. Um, that's my understanding of the motivation for the question. That's that's also something we didn't try. That's also uh, an interesting direction. Um, uh, yeah, that would certainly help with the issue that that you have um, uh, multiple uh, models um, because they each of them would only have would only need a little bit of storage space memory. Um, uh, I, I think that's a good comment. Yes, thank you. All right. So I think we have unfortunately no more time for further questions uh, live. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Henrik, for the great talk and for the great discussion. And thanks to every, everybody who co have contributed questions. We have quite um, many questions uh, left unanswered. And I'd like to invite everybody to take the discussion offline. Uh, to Slack, there's a special channel uh, for the keynote uh, talk where uh, the questions can be discussed further and the discussion has demonstrated that there is a lot of potential for additional ideas and experiments that can be done building on top of this work. So thanks a lot, Henrik. And Thank you. Um, 
Now I'd like to move to the next um, item on our uh, 